welcome back to another episode of Explain Yourself. This is EntSoc Day 2, and we're here with Catherine, who has agreed to talk to us about her research and her grad school experiences. So thank you so much for being with us. Um, so I always like to start everybody off with, give me your elevator speech for your research. Sure, so I'm looking at how we can better crop rotations. So crop rotations are just when you have a certain sequence of crops that you grow on a piece of land. And so we're looking at what's going on with the soil and how we can better implement crop rotations just based on soil plant interactions. Okay, so like alternating different plants on the same piece of land. Yes, okay. yes, for cool. sure. Yep. And then of course, because I'm an entomologist, we're also looking at the herbivores, right. <laughs> the natural enemies, things like that. Okay, so. awesome. Yeah. Um, are you a fan of XKCD? I do not know what that is. Oh my gosh. Okay, so XKCD <laughs> is a webcomic, but the reason I ask is because um, they've developed this thing called the Simple Writer. So what you do, you type words in there. So you're going to say, I study, and then explain your research in like a sentence or so. But any word that shows up in red is not simple enough. So this is using oh like the hundred or thousand most commonly used words oh. in the English language. Yes. So this is breaking down your um, science communication into something that is completely jargon free and sometimes uh -huh. it goes a little overboard. You can't use insect or bug, I'll warn you, because it's really frustrating for all of us. What? Uh, yeah. Alright, so Catherine's really simple elevator sp speech is, I study why we grow food on certain pieces of land and how this changes what tiny animals feed on it. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. And yeah, again, it, this is a super exaggerated example, but I think it's a fun challenge and it gets us thinking about what words may or may not be familiar to our audience when we're thinking about science communication jargon just, mm, you know, That you don't even think about. I glaze over when it. I hear jargon, I'm not familiar with. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. So it's um, about making all of this relatable. Yeah. So now that you've given us two versions of your elevator pitch, uh, you can expand <laughs> a little more without having to use all of the simple words um, and tell us a little bit more broadly what you do. <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah. So um, it's really not known um, why we grow crops in certain rotations over others. So a lot of it is just producers have been doing this for years and years, sometimes even decades. Their grandfathers have been doing the same yeah. things. <laughs> so they just kind of continue on as tradition says. And so we're really trying to understand scientifically why we're doing this, what makes a good crop rotation, is it the soil, is it the environment, is it the herbivores that are feeding on it. So we're really trying to base crop rotation in science because a lot of it isn't actually in the scientific literature. So we're hoping to one day, <laughs> far in the future of course, <laughs> to be able to inform producers how they can better crop rotations and you know maybe even um, incorporate crops that they wouldn't normally incorporate, mm -hmm. you know, um, things like cover crops and things um, that we don't necessarily grow for food, but mm -hmm. still might be beneficial to yeah. work into our rotations. So when you say better rotations, you mean better for the environment and for the soil quality, but also maybe better for their productivity as Correct. a farmer? Correct. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. So more sustainable methods. Of cool. course, we want to reduce inputs into the environment, but we also want to help them because they're not going to implement any of these strategies unless it's helpful for their yield. Right. Yeah. So, so yes, we're trying to, you know, of course, best case scenario, reduce inputs, increase sustainability while increasing yield and profit as well. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Um, so do you have any insights now? Have you, has, um, has what you've been looking at sort of reinforced the status quo or have you found sort of any sort of like uh, logic upsets? Uh. <laughs> um, we have been reinforcing the status quo so um, I don't know how jargony you want me to get but <laughs> typically farmers really the only rule that they use is to not grow within the same plant family year after year. Sure. So plants yeah. require the same sort of resources mm -hmm. and if they're closely related to one another then they're going to be even more similar in their resource requirements. You also can get pathogen buildup, pest buildup, mm -hmm. things like that. So um, we have found that yes planting within family does reduce the, um, we've just been looking at plant growth, mm -hmm. does reduce plant growth. But we've also found that a number of other families can also negatively impact plant growth. So it's not just within family, okay. it seems. Um, but we've been, we've conducted one greenhouse study on this and I've just finished my first field season. Oh. So <laughs> results are pending. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I guess when I think of crop rotation, I hear about like corn and soybeans. 
beans and alternating back and forth <laughs> and soybeans are what we would call a legume and so that's one like plant group right yes. and then corn is technically a grass which yes. blows people's minds so <laughs> when you say not within the same family does that mean if I wanted to it would be a bad idea for me to rotate um, corn and like wheat or rye which are also grasses right which are also commonly used in rotation ah. <laughs> with corn and soybean okay um, hypothetically yes um, but corn is a special case because the main reason that they rotate it is to reduce pest prevalence right and so because that pest doesn't feed on wheat which is normally what they rotate with it it's usually okay okay um, but that's what focusing on that single pest on western corn rootworm right. which is the major yeah, yeah. <laughs> reduction in corn yield yes. so so you know, if we think beyond Western corn rootworm, we might actually indeed see negative effects of growing wheat after corn or vice versa. So if we look more at what's going on with the biotic soil community, nutrient demands, things like that. Okay, um, and you said that you are looking at the herbivores, the herbivorous insects. So are you looking at the corn rootworm or is it an above ground pest that you're interested in? Um, so we're actually focusing on tomatoes. Oh. So I'm not working with corn specifically. Okay. So we're looking at um, a wide variety wide phylogenetic variety <laughs> um, of plants and how they influence tomatoes. So okay. I've focused on um, Manduca sexta, the tobacco hornworm, which ah. is a key herbivore of tomato. Those are giant. Yes, they get meaty. <laughs> they're big. Um, yeah, they're, their adults are like as big as hummingbirds. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, we've been focusing on tomato. Um, and again, we're going to, we're going to focus on probably the above ground herbivores. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're easier to, look at <laughs> during the field season. They're easy to see, of course. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, we'll be focusing on above ground stuff, but yeah. I'm also, do <laughs> also doing stuff in corn, but I, yeah, oh, well, we yeah. can focus so, on crop rotation. That's the major, sure. yes. Sure. Um, so you said that you just finished your first field season. Is that, that's not like your first field season ever. Oh, though, no. Right? <laughs> so, so um, tell us a little bit more about like your academic background and what you're doing, like sure. where you are in the process. Yeah, yeah. So I graduated with my PhD in August of 2016. So I started at Purdue University as a postdoc in 2017, um, September, or, I'm sorry, September of 2016. So I've been... <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So I've been at Purdue for just over a year. Okay. Um, so during my PhD, I was working on um, natural enemy insect interactions, and I was looking at aphids and parasitoid wasps. Awesome. Yes. <laughs> um, and I was kind of looking at both the consumptive, so the rate of parasitism, um, and how that's impacted when we increase the uh, diversity of the natural enemy community or of the parasitoid community. So when you increase the number of species that you have, how does that influence parasitism? I was also looking at how the behavior changes um, and specifically more on the side of aphid behavior and um, the non-consumptive effects. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if you're familiar with that realm. So they're... Well, so aphids sort of, they're like little cows. They live in herds, right? Yes, so do you yes. mean like that their herds act differently when there is a, um, a higher presence of these parasitoids? Around? Yes, okay. yes, yes. So they respond to the presence of parasitoids even before they have any it, before they touch them. Okay. Um, <laughs> I was like, before they have any tactile stimulation. No. Before they touch them. Yes. Um, <laughs> so yes, they can actually sense the vibrations on the plants. Oh, and I thought it was going to be chemicals, but it's it's the vibration. Yes, they cool. can sense the vibration. They okay. can also um, sense the different. Um, oh shoot, <laughs> the wing vibrations. Um, oh. How fast they vibrate. What is that called? Yes, so they can detect frequency? the difference. Yes, okay, yes. The frequency of vibrations <laughs> okay, cool. are specific to parasitoids, and they can actually sense that. Oh. And um, like you said, they they're kind of in herds or colonies, mm -hmm. and um, they they also respond to one another. Oh, so okay. if one aphid senses something, or maybe get gets brushed by a parasitoid, mm -hmm. then it will send up a signal, and all of the the aphids will start freaking out and oh. do a number of things. Okay. Um, so I was working with pea aphids, and they're kind of cool because they fall off the plants. <laughs> In response to danger, just like, Peace out. yes, yes, they're like, see you later. Um, but it has to, it has to be a really dangerous situation because um, aphids. 
plug their stylets into oh, the phloem sure. and it's really hard for them to get a good feeding site. So they kind of have to be irritated and agitated. They'll, they'll kick their legs, they'll spit out some defensive secretions before they actually fall off the plants. But Is there also a cost? Because they're so small, like if they fall to the ground then they have to like climb all the way back up onto the, right? So, yes, yeah, okay. yes, exactly. There's a serious cost yeah. in just dropping off the plants. Um, and, and aphids, the, yeah, so they'll plug their stylets in, they'll feed on the phloem, they'll sit there and they reproduce asexually mm -hmm. and they have live birth so they literally just sit and pump out babies yep. like crazy. I think they're fascinating. <laughs> yes, they're, yes they are mm -hmm. indeed. So um, so yeah there's a serious cost in fecundity as well as yeah. fitness. Um, so yeah I looked at uh, pea aphids, green peach aphids and two of their parasitoids and how the consumptive non-consumptive interactions change um, based on a number of different things. Aphid densities, wasp densities, wasp <laughs> presence, absence, aphid presence, absence. Mm -hmm. So yeah, lots of different aspects. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, now I've definitely shifted gears into a more applied mm -hmm. um, study now in my postdoc, which is nice, awesome. but, but yeah, <laughs> definitely different. <laughs> cool. So it sounds like you've done a lot of field work -y type stuff, so yeah. what are your like ideal field work conditions? Mm -hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Not muddy and rainy, because uh -huh. there was a lot of muddy and rainy in Indiana this summer. Um, yes, uh, a newfound love for like how to perfect the perfect mud scraping technique mm -hmm. off of your boots. Because mm -hmm. it's to not ones, make all the. All caked on there. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, and to not make your um, custodial staff angry at you. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, Indiana and Missouri are both great places. Um, I mean, yeah, they get kind of hot, but for the most part, you have a long field season. Mm -hmm. You know, you can work from April. I worked into October. Yep. So, so yeah, I mean, they're not terrible and it's a good place to be because there's a lot of agricultural production and so. Yeah, right in the so, thick of things. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> a lot of growers to talk to, nice. which is nice. Yeah. Um, so what is your favorite part about your research? Um, I think honestly, like data analysis, oh. because it tells you, it starts to tell you the story of what's going on, you know, so usually when you're setting up your experiment, you're collecting data from that experiment, you kind of maybe have an inkling, like, oh, I'm seeing these certain type of patterns, yeah. but when you really put it in the computer, pump out your statistics, it can actually tell you, like, yes, there's a trend occurring here, you found something, and then you can kind of move on to parse out what exactly is going on, ecologically, biologically, that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. But but I think just seeing the output, seeing the graphs and the data and it all coming together, you're like, yes, this is awesome. You know, <laughs> I can finally know what's going on. I, I thought that this was happening, but now it's here. And yeah. I could see it, so. And that's a wonderfully nerdy answer, but like, I think <laughs> yeah. it has a lot of value because yeah, like, like you said, oh, if you were just doing the field work, like we see patterns all the time, but like whether or not those patterns are actually there or if it's just kind of in our heads. Right. So like, yeah, the data analysis is supremely important so that we know that what we saw is actually happening. Exactly. Yeah. Because we're humans, we have yeah. biases. Yes. <laughs> so. so yeah, you could you could see what you want to see, but your numbers will tell you the truth. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Awesome. And it it also helps that I got my undergrad degree in math. So. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I've always enjoyed numbers. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes. Um, so is there something about your research that you really sort of dislike? Ooh. Unnecessary evil. Um. I'm <laughs> like, ooh, this might <laughs> sound bad later on, but definitely the peer review process is the hardest. So Why? <laughs> um, I would say because we are humans, we're also scientists, so we try and not be biased in how we write up our, our, mm -hmm. our data, our, our findings and things like that. But of course, you, because we're humans, we have emotions. And so you care about when, what you did. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so when we really invest a lot of time and effort into something, you go back and forth with your co-author and you finally submit something and you get it back with a, just a flat out rejection. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> this really stinks. Yeah. So, so I think that's the hardest part and, um, and just trying to um, cater to kind of what everybody interprets from your own data mm -hmm. that maybe you didn't see. Yeah. So when the peer reviewers parse out small little details, oh my goodness, I didn't see that, I didn't, I didn't think about that, which is the upside of peer review. Yeah. That's why it's, it's so good. <laughs> yes, but at the same time you're like, oh my goodness, okay, all right, let me, let me reconsider everything <laughs> about everything and redo this all again. So, mm -hmm. 
like you said, necessary evil, but I think the most time consuming, grueling part, at least for me now, currently, since I'm so early in my career, yeah. um, but, but yeah, it's how you spread your knowledge. So exactly. <laughs> and yeah, I think that might be something else that people don't necessarily think about. Um, like, Oh, scientists, they do research, they put out their results, but like, <laughs> no, like we face a ton of rejection and it's because we are so invested in keeping each other honest right? and making sure that what we wrote up actually is true and interpreted correctly that, yeah, like it becomes becomes very difficult and if you get a flat out rejection you have to completely rewrite the paper so there's way more work behind each finding than you exactly. might realize. Yeah. Oh for sure, for sure, <laughs> yes, yes. And I think being a good writer if you're not naturally inclined is also very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so writing in a succinct, clear way in a thoughtful way is very hard too. So yeah. yes, I'm learning though. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Uh, so we'll sort of go back to the beginning. Why did you decide to become a scientist and why did you decide to go to grad school? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I was an undergraduate math mm -hmm. major actually. And in my senior year of undergraduate, I was in an introductory entomology course. And Yay. yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> we will convert you. Uh, yes, yes. And, and it was because I, as an undergraduate, I didn't want to take a foreign language. Mm. And my um, university said, well, if you just take a bunch of hours in some subject other than your main topic, you can um, kind of not do the foreign language and do this applied topic instead. So I chose cool. biology because I love biology. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, I was in the introductory entomology course and I actually, the morning of an exam, I pinched a nerve in my neck. <gasps> yes, so I was <laughs> immobile. I was literally like this with ice on my neck because I didn't know what was going oh, on. Oh no. Because it never happened before. And uh, I was in, at the hospital and I emailed, you know, Thank the gods for uh, smartphones because mm -hmm. I emailed my professor and said, I'm so, so sorry. Um, is there any way that I can retake the exam? And so I ended up, of course, having to go to his office hours yeah. and take the exam. And so we got to talking and he asked me about my life <laughs> and what I was doing with it. And I said, I'm not really sure. I was actually looking at uh, math graduate programs okay. and biostatistics programs. Nice. And, but <laughs> they don't usually pay for your tuition or give you a stipend. Mm. So. I wasn't in debt yet from my undergrad and I didn't really want to go into debt to go to graduate school and um, the professor for the course put me in contact with my graduate advisor um, after, yes, we had talked and I expressed to him my, um, <laughs> I don't know, my uh, concerns. <laughs> yes, yes, my <laughs> concerns and I didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so he really had a, a good influence on me to to just at least introduce me to my advisor and and then uh, it kind of flourished from there. I, I started um, as a master's student in my graduate advisor's lab, in Debbie Finke's lab, and I was just going to get a, a master's degree. And year two, when I was about to write my thesis, she said, actually, I still have funding. Um, oh. <laughs> so if you would like, instead of graduating, you can just kind of continue on and complete your PhD and jump over a master's. So nice. just go right from undergrad to a PhD. And, um, and that's a pretty good deal. <laughs> you know, if you want to get a PhD and you know that you want to get a PhD, then of course it's great in many ways. Um, but <laughs> I say that there are also cons. Sure. So yeah. having a master's <laughs> is also great. Um, so yeah, that, that's what happened. So I, I converted over to just a PhD and uh, now I'm here. <laughs> yes, yes. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah that worked yeah. out really well. But yeah, I feel like um, a lot of people's grad school stories involve an existential crisis. Like <laughs> well, we're calling it the mid or the quarter life crisis. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Oh, I know. Yeah, I had no idea what I wanted to do. and. Yeah, my the math department at my at Mizzou, um, I didn't find much help in their uh, advisors and things like that. So it was, yeah, it was nice to, to have this situation arise. <laughs> yeah, yeah a, a quality mentor is a very important thing. Yes, yeah. yes, it is, and I I definitely didn't realize that as an undergraduate. You know, you you hear your parents say talk to your professors, yeah. sit at the front of the class, and and honestly, it really does help. Mm -hmm. And 
I'm sure I'll be telling my kids the same thing <laughs> whenever yeah. that happens and they'll professors see. are people too <laughs> yes yes <laughs> maybe I'll have a little bit more of a clout because I hopefully I might be a faculty member by oh, then well, but yeah, you know you <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> so along that train of thought, is there um, or are there any scientists who sort of like inspire you or that you, you really look up to in terms of like, you know, wanting to emulate them or? Yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of scientists that are really great writers. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I enjoy a good scientific paper that's also really easy to read. Okay. Right, so I mean, my graduate advisor is a great author. Um, my current postdoc advisor is a great <laughs> author, and that's one of the reasons why um, mm -hmm. I'm in his lab now. So, so yeah, I mean, I really just enjoy good scientists who are also thoughtful in how they write and how they spread their message, um, and people that are great speakers too. You know, I've seen a number of seminar speakers come and and just have amazing talks that I might not know hardly anything about their system, but I come away with just a respect for them as a scientist. So, um, so yeah, specific names, yeah. Debbie, my current advisor, Ian. Um, but, but yeah, apart from that, there's just a, a, a scattering sure. of various authors that I, uh, I make sure to read their papers whenever I see them come out. So, so yeah. My favorite part of this is that there's a theme that you appreciate people who communicate their science ah. well, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's because that is the end goal, right? We need yes. to share with people what we did and it has to be, yeah, even if you aren't a specialist in their field, it's still important for you to understand what they did because it can inform on your work or it can impact your life in other ways. So, yes, yeah. yes, yeah, exactly. Awesome. And I mean, yeah, like you said, that's the end goal and it makes all of our lives easier if we can better understand each other. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Yes. Um, so this is my heartbreaker question um, oh, because goodness. all of us love insects so much, but if somebody told you stop you can never study insects ever, ever again. What organismal group would you do research on instead? Um, well, now I'm like heavily influenced by plants okay. and microbes. Um, and I, I think that plants are much more interesting than I thought they were <laughs> <laughs> when I was in my PhD program. Okay. Um, so yeah, I would probably make my way over into agricultural crop plantings, um, maybe even some weed science and things mm. like that. So. Um, so yeah, I would probably go into like agronomy, <laughs> nice, nice. yes, yes, <laughs> and like plant protection and stuff Ooh, like that. So, yeah. so yeah, but yeah, as long as it's in the agricultural sector, That's I would fair. be yes, yes. I wanna, I wanna feed the world, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> or help to at least. <laughs> So, yeah. So if you could go back in time to tell younger Catherine one thing that you had to learn the hard way so that she wouldn't have to learn it the hard way <laughs> about, about grad school and research and being a scientist, what, what, what advice would you provide to your younger oh. self? Hmm. To stay in the lab and finish what you can in a day because it's not <laughs> worth putting off. <laughs> yeah. um, so usually I was pretty good about that, but you know, there were just some times when, ugh, I'm tired, it's two o'clock, I'm just gonna go home. And I, but all those times that I stayed until, you know, seven, eight, nine, mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at night, it's worth it <laughs> because okay. it just makes the whole process easier. You know, when you really put the time in, um, you know, arrange your data well, make good manuscripts and <laughs> make good dissertation chapters. So, so yeah, putting the time in while you can um, because you know you never know how long you're going to be in a certain position or a certain program. So taking advantage of every single opportunity that you have um, is really, yeah. So yeah, I guess I'm involving my answer. So taking the time <laughs> and also taking advantage of opportunities. Sure. So. So I tried to be a part of organizations at the University of Missouri mm -hmm. and and I really enjoyed the time that I had with them and my only regret is that I didn't do it sooner. So I was I was definitely kind of just on the outskirts to begin with, you know, and didn't really dive in wholeheartedly mm -hmm. until my later years. And so so yeah, I would say get involved, take the time and really take advantage of all the opportunities that are afforded to you. That's very true. Um, how do you reconcile all of that with the idea of like a work-life balance? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I definitely 
I uh, think that a work-life balance is important. Mm -hmm. And luckily, my uh, boss thinks so too. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Thank <so>. you. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and, and, you know, my graduate advisor as well. I, I tell you that I was there late. She probably wouldn't like the fact that I was there late because she realized, you know what, when it gets to be five o'clock, six o'clock, you're not doing good work anymore. You need to go home, rest your mind, rest your body, come back to me fresh in the morning. Yeah. Um, That's so, not to say when you're working on something really exciting or like, or something you can't stop halfway through, like please stay and finish it, but yeah, yes. like, definitely oh, take for those sure. breaks too. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I mean, work-life balance is paramount, and I think that it's something, you know, obviously that's kind of a hot topic right now in science, mm -hmm. because especially early professionals, such as postdocs, professors that do not yet have tenure, mm -hmm. it's kind of expected, oh, you work 60, 70, 80 hours a week to get what's done, done. But that's and, miserable. <laughs> oh, exactly, exactly. Way to burn me out in the first, mm -hmm. you know, the prime years um, of my career. But, but yeah, I mean, like, like I said, luckily I have a boss who respects that, and so, um, so yeah, no, I definitely, I might work a few hours here and there on the weekends and do what I have to do again to finish mm -hmm. up projects, yeah. of course, but, but yes, I'll take a few days off then later, <laughs> later in the year, yes, yeah, yeah, to compensate, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what do you think is your biggest strength as a researcher? Um, I would say being thorough Ooh. so <laughs> so you know whenever we're first start to talk about oh this area of interest that we really want to start designing studies in um, you know I really try to delve in and find out what's going on in the current literature because you know like I said I kind of switched topics <laughs> heavily um, when I when I graduated from my PhD um, so I really had to dive into the literature and find out what was going on what what protocols were because I didn't even know it was standard protocol so yeah thoroughness and um, kind of covering all my bases I like to you know really think on a day-to-day -day basis especially when I'm conducting a study you know what exactly I need to do. I don't like flying by the seat of my pants at all. So, okay. <laughs> yes, awesome. yeah. Uh, flip that, what do you think, because of your early career yet, what do you think is the thing that you need to be working on the most yet? Yeah, um, I would say writing, for sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, <laughs> this theme keeps coming back. <laughs> um, yeah, so like I said, one of the, the big reasons that I chose my current advisor, I mean, he's, He's an amazing scientist in general and an amazing communicator. And um, I think that um, just gaining more experience in science in general, coming to talks and meetings like this, you know, and just getting a, a greater appreciation for agricultural research, plant insects, microbe interactions, all of these things um, is going to provide me with insight to where I can become a better, a better communicator because mm -hmm. I can better just, um, understand how to you know phrase my my science and make it work in the current research and so provide context yes yeah. yes exactly because I feel like I get I get bogged down in the details sometimes ah. and I'm going to write <laughs> things all. out yes yes so so I always need to tell myself you know take a step back what are you really trying to accomplish mm -hmm. and so so yeah that's something that I uh, I am continuing to work on <laughs> both with my PhD advisor to get things published and now um, at Purdue so so yeah that's Yes, awesome. <laughs> that's what I would say, yeah, right. for sure. <laughs> um, so just the last wrap up question, I guess, is uh, what's next for you? Where are you going past this point? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure. That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> so so ideally, I, I loved teaching um, as a graduate student, and I've also had a couple of opportunities as a postdoc. Okay. So I would love to eventually teach in some capacity, mm -hmm. whether that be formally at a university or informally. Um, um, you know, uh, just educating people about science and entomology, <laughs> if the opportunity is afforded to me. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's the end game. But um, but I'm cognizant of the situation in academia and things like that. So I'm willing to, you know, definitely sidestep that and and get experience in other areas as well. So so yeah, I'm just kind of open to opportunities and 
working on myself as a scientist and hoping that things work out. Fantastic. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, we wish you all the best of luck with all of that. And thank you. Again, I want to thank Catherine so much for sitting down and talking to us. Uh, if you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so that you can get notifications when I post new videos. You can also follow me on Facebook and Twitter, and I'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Thanks.